Hello! Welcome to Sketching with Izzy. Let's do a sound check since there was no sound last time. Jesus! How you all doing? All is working. Great. See real quick. Hmm, I did not get your first message, Irina. That's weird. Dan Rob, Irina, welcome, welcome, welcome all. Let me turn down my music. It's a little, a little too beefy for me. Working on Doodlebug today. Um. Yeah. So, started the new job. That's going pretty well. I have not yet worked out with them how Twitch and uh, and the job will be fully integrated. So um, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go back to work after. Uh, we won't really count this as work for now. But since it's a remote job, as long as I get my hours in, I get my hours in. Um, but yeah, the, the job's pretty cool. Everybody's been pretty nice so far. It's really weird not actually meeting people in person. <laughs> I know that this is going to be very problematic for me in the coming future, whatever, because I'm really, really bad with names, like really bad. And I'm usually I'm able to remember stuff like that via context through like conversations and really memorizing a person's face. Um, otherwise, I guess I kind of have like a, a blindness about it, but I don't know how it's going to work with this. So. Yeah, it's, I'm doomed that way. <laughs> Hope you all are doing well. For my sketches, my other doodlebug sketches. Thanks, Irina. Yeah. Doodlebug is looking super over rendered to me. So. I'm gonna go and look. I'm gonna try and find some of the places where I over rendered it and knock that back. I think these, um, these reflective lights on his face are just too much. It's so easy to kind of fixate uh, with rendering when I'm doing the, the chatting here because it's it's not something, I mean, really focusing on a painting. I mean, you most of you are painters too. You know that when you're getting focused, you do, you're not really thinking about anything else. So con conversing, entertaining, telling stories and things like that, sometimes the painting kind of falls to the backside, which is no good. Which means I over-render some parts on accident. So, a lot of times we end up just cleaning up previous easy mistakes. What exactly is my role? I am the art director on their new uh, HD game they're planning. Um, so I'm, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm I'm there for ground floor building building up from there. So I mean, it's just me and another guy right now, which is kind of cool. That's that's the ideal if you're talking making games. You want to be there at the very beginning so you can, you know, influence as much as possible. Um, I'll be doing a lot of. Um, I mean, we're going to be pitching first. I just had meetings with uh, with the creative director, so we'll be building pitches and uh, you know just trying to trying to make something not make something but uh, sit, create an idea to sell that's good and fun and cool that we can get backing for can I share what company it is sure it's uh, it's not a company yet it's a it's a seed company inside of another company the other company is called Amber Studio and they're traditionally a game servicing company. So what they do is like uh, subcontracting and contracting for other big studios. And so they worked on tons of big games and, and they've contributed a lot to mobile stuff. But what they really do is support. And what they're looking to do is to get, at, get into making their own products, their own titles. So that's what I've been brought in to do is to help out with the artistic vision for whatever the title will be. I mean, at this point, we have no idea. It's a 
It's totally a gray box question mark. No idea. So that's exciting. I mean, that'll be fun to figure that out and sort of start to assemble the team necessary to make things happen. It's going to be a really small, tiny, tiny, tiny game, but uh, I think it'll be good for uh, the studio to prove that they can do this, and it'll be good for me to prove that I can do it, and all that stuff. I think it's going to be a win-win for everybody. And I'm, I'm confident we can come up with something at least that's very fresh and cool, at least cool looking. Um, but you know, there, there's so much more to uh, game development than just making the game, you know? You gotta sell an idea, you gotta get people to support it, you gotta get people interested and hyped to play it and buy it. It's, I mean, there's a huge business side to this that I don't normally deal with. So it's gonna be, gonna be an interesting transition, I'll tell you that. Let's, uh, let's work on these foreground elements that I've neglected quite a bit lately. Let's do uh, the TV and the acorn table. Is it a new company? The comp so it's kind of like, all right, so do you guys remember that game company? Or you know that game company? They did Sky and Journey and stuff like that. Well, that game company was uh, sort of built inside of another company. I think that's how that one worked anyway. But there was, there, Sony used to have an incubation studio where they would, they would have a little studio that would come up with ideas, but it was all under the umbrella of Sony. So this company is doing that too. It's, an, it's not a new company. They've been around for a long time, but they've been doing a completely different, they've been in the games industry in a completely different fashion. And what, I'm, what they want to do is to start showing that they can actually deliver original content. And that's where I come in. I'm gonna be helping them on that end. So I'm not helping with the, the company's other extant responsibilities. I'm part of a seed company within the company. And right now it's just a couple of guys and we're doing, we're gonna come up with a game pitch, sell the pitch idea to the company and then start assembling a demo. And hopefully uh, maybe less than a year, of course, I think. And in a number of months, we'll have a rough demo and start showing that to publishers. And once, once you get publishers, then the publisher you're gonna want to get like a uh, get some support, they'll, they'll, the publisher is basically just like publishing a comic or a book. What they do is they're like, okay, we like this premise. We like the idea here. Here's money. Here's a bunch of capital. Go make the thing. And then we'll put it out for you. And so that's, that's generally how that works. Right now we have, there's publishers that, that they've talked to already and, uh, on, on other ideas. And so now we just got to get an idea that's going to sell and get it going. Sounds like fun and a lot of pressure. Yeah, it is. But I'm try I'm going to treat it basically just like anything else in terms of a job. I'm just going to do my best and try and have as much fun as I can. Make cool stuff. And like I said, I'm, I'm really hoping to integrate it with uh, Twitch. So I'll be really open and talking about the process here. And y'all can sort of hang hang out and enjoy the ride and watch my either total success or utter failure. <laughs> It'll be fun either way. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be good, really good experience. I, I'm excited about that aspect of it. So the current plan that I'm hoping to do is um, I'd like to. Uh, do the do the generation here on Twitch uh, simultaneously, and that means it's gonna that I'm gonna have to change my hours probably for the uh, for the show. So for now, until until I get legal and all that stuff locked down, so that I can be streaming on hours and actually doing both jobs simultaneously, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have to bump this one back to three probably. I don't know if that's way too late for some of you. Um, but ideally how it will go in the future, once I'm able to integrate the two, I'll actually be doing the show earlier in the day and I'll be doing it during the week. So potentially we could be starting the show at like 10 AM my time and, uh, just 
being on for the the rest of the day. So you, you're getting like half of my work day, and uh, we just hang out and talk about game development and art and cool stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not stopping the streaming. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that I can find a way to successfully integrate the two things. Because um, I'd like, I'd love for you guys to see the process of this and kind of see how the sausage is made. Because it's, I mean, there's, you're probably not going to be seeing the meeting stuff because it's just boring. Um, it's not, it's all just kind of ideation and, and listening. Um, but the way we have it set up, because the main, the main offices are in Romania, I have to deal with time differences too. So I get up and I start work at 7 a.m. And the first four hours basically are devoted to just interacting with the studio over there. And then the, the following four hours will be all about uh, just generating the content that I've been discussing. 3 p.m. is too late for you? Yeah, I, okay. Um, shit. So uh, the other option is, is that I can still split the day. Like I can do, I could do a stream for a couple of hours during, during 12. I mean, no matter what, I'm definitely doing the episode for this coming month and we are going to be doing absolutely crits and I'd like to keep the crits going into the future, bare minimum. It's the episodes that are going to have to start slowing down, but uh, we'll do crits and uh, I'll work it out with you guys. We'll get a time done. Uh, that's the cool thing about working remote is I can kind of split my day up. So. I'm, I'm not abandoning you. <laughs> I'm totally going to keep this going. Uh, I, I think uh, it will continue to be helpful. It's just we're going to have a little bit of an awkward short period here. You know you know how it is. Oh, by the way, how is the sound? Does it sound terribly different? I have my mic in a different spot. Does it sound... Uh, are you picking up any weird background noises or anything like that? Because normally I have it right in front of my face and it annoys the shit out of me. You didn't notice the difference? Okay, I am leaving the mic far away from me so I can stop bumping it and stuff. <laughs> you don't have, you have no idea the freedom of just being able to like move my cup around in this space, move my hands out here. This is so nice. <laughs> you can't see my hand talking no more though. All right. Um, I have fallen out of love with Doodlebug. This happens to me. Let's let's be frank. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, I often will start a painting and really enjoy myself as I'm painting it. I'm having fun, and then I come back to it later. I'm like, nah, I'm not loving it anymore. It's not doing what it was doing. Uh, I doubt that will happen. If any of you were with me to watch me paint uh, Chunkosaurus last uh, on the last episode. That was super fun, and I still love Chunkosaurus, so I think uh, that's one that's going to hold for ages and ages. <laughs> um, but Doodlebug, it, see this is this is what I've, I've talked about before with when it comes to rendering. If you over render one part, then getting the rest to catch up is like, it's like pulling your fingernails out with pliers, it just... Uh, just about anything is better than having to try and finish up the rest of the painting when you're done with the fun part. Always save it for dessert. Um, but the problem, this is the this is the struggle, right? Is you know I'm sitting here watching viewers decline when I when I just sit and gab about something or when I'm not painting something fun. I'm just painting you know acorns, acorn stools. So people are just disappearing. So I'm like, oh God, I better do something funny or fun or entertain, must entertain. It's a challenge. It's hard to do like full illustration this way because so, I mean, many of you again are painters and you know, you just need to buckle down sometimes and just get through the poopy parts. Do I dislike doing the cheap depth of, depth of field trick of blurring things? Um, no, I mean, it has its place, both visually, narratively, uh, and, well, all visually, narratively, and for, frankly, using it as a shortcut. Uh, it has its place. I have no problem with doing it. Uh, the problem is, is that I prefer to plan these things out. So if I'm going to do that, I need to be doing it from the beginning 
to make sure that everything leans towards that so it doesn't feel like I'm using it as a cheat in order to not spend extra time on that thing. <clears throat> and that's, that is a challenge in and of itself. How, how to manage your time, how to plan your time for, for a painting. It's kind of like when you're painting traditionally, I don't know if many of you do, but a, a huge part of traditional painting and really getting that painting to work and look great is the planning phase. And so you sit and you work, you plan, you paint up your, your, your you mix your palette ahead of time. These are, this is all stuff that you want to do beforehand. And it's definitely true for digital painting as well. Plan your painting and your painting is going to look better always think about what it is you're going to do and then you're going to save more time it's it's the best thing to do in pretty much every respect unless what you do is specifically about off the cuff and there's absolutely artists like that that's totally fine it's just if you're a working professional that's a very difficult way to do this i think that's why gallery artists have it easier sometimes is they can just kind of go make stuff and we have to really figure shit out. This looks like a butthole and I don't like it. <laughs> I'm gonna get rid of the stem altogether. <laughs> That's why Kim Jong-gi is so baffling. Yeah, it's interesting to watch him because I think uh, what he really does is he's actually a super planner. It looks like he's it looks like he's just an off the cuff guy, but I have a feeling like the way he goes, first of all, he knows he can trust his ability to fix any problem that he creates for himself. And that's key in his success with his sort of off the cuff, especially like the three dimensional drawings, is he knows his tools, he knows uh, his skills so well that he can trust in them and just kind of make a leap of faith. And that's kind of that's kind of something that you have to learn to do. It's just to learn your skills and, and trust yourself enough to make that leap. Uh, he's a special case, obviously. Um, he's just one of those guys. But I think when you are adoring him, keep in mind that that is something, that is one of his specialties, is to be able to plan. He sees... He seems to see things, you know, because he's just drawn so damn much, he seems to see things as, um, like he can he can look at an, at an empty canvas and just go zoom and plants it into his head. Okay, this is, this is the rough space where this is going to live. This is the space this is going to live. This will roughly be the perspective that the camera is working at. And he basically has a picture in his mind. It's not... I mean, it, this is the this is how I work too. The picture is usually not super worked out. There's a lot of the fun part is the discovery, like how it's going to be different than if you were able to just take a flash of the image in your mind and make it so. The discovery and the growth and the mistakes that you make along the way are the fun part of doing what we do. So that's that's you got to lean into that. Um, <clears throat> so we we did a little jump on Peter last time. Um, Peter's very similar to Kim Jong-hee in how he draws. Um, and again, I've, I've had the great fortune of knowing him basically my whole life. So I've, me and, I've asked Pete tons of times how he seems to come up with his shit out of his head. And it's, it is just intense study. It really is. Um, you just draw the same stuff, you, you examine, and then you learn the basic tools of explaining visually something in three dimensions and you put those things together and it looks like you're printing as you draw. It's definitely possible. But it again, this it's planning that makes it that makes it so. I don't like this ellipse, I don't think. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not even sure if the table should be there, to be honest. I'm starting to feel like it's just uh, taking away from our little beetle doodle bug. Let's, let's make a new layer and test. Anytime I'm questioning my, my compositions, this is something that I'll do pretty regularly. I'll just get in there and just get rid of shit. Never be precious. Are you guys getting spammed by welcome to the chat room messages too? Or is that just me on, on my end? 
my chat is behaving, my chat panel on uh, OBS is behaving strangely today. You don't see any spam? Okay, it's just me. Don't worry about it. I was just worried it would it would be annoying for you guys. Yeah, I think this might be the way to go. I really don't need that device there. Eep, that's not the color I picked. I will, of course, pull out the brush that I did the previous flooring with in a moment, but I just want to get the values down. I think we need to spread out the base of this. Actually, let's just go lazy. Oops. So I haven't actually uh, started planning out the the new video just yet. <clears throat> we're, in, we're in that perfect day. We're basically the day before I start really planning it out. Um, and I happen to have you guys on here. Most of you are patrons. Uh, did, was there anything as of late that you guys have been interested in maybe me focusing on for the lesson or things you've been struggling with lately that I can help out with. Yeah, I think this is much better. It feels less cramped. <laughs> is there anything recently that you struggled with that maybe I can help with? I mean, even that last piece we talked about, um, I can cover some stuff in there or whatever. Just offering it as a, as a possibility. You got it from your last feedback that there cannot be two focal points. Am I right to think that painterly brushwork is a way to do a soft edge, lost and found edges transition? Uh, do you want me to dig into edges again? We can do a second edge ninjutsu episode. Um, yeah, I think absolutely you would want to use your brushwork to, I mean, you want to use every tool you have in your toolbox, right? And brushwork is just one of those things that can help uh, indicate focal points but in your particular piece there were things like vibrant color uh, it was more than just edge edge control that was causing uh, conflicts between your focal points 
you want to have your focal points be or you want to have your focal point be clear and uh, you can have multiple points of interest don't confuse points of interest in an image with uh, focal points the focal point is your visual that's it's the the contact point of the knuckle right that's the visual punch pow that's the first thing that's going to be hitting that's the thing where you're gonna your eye is going to be drawn for the longest um, and you're you're using all of your tools to kind of push towards that you used to think it's not important so you'll make it look like broad strokes uh, that's fine but the problem is is that if you have so in the in an in an example right so let's pull up uh, let me kind of make a little drawing real quick here so if we have uh, let's say we've got a figure right that's there and we've got uh, some ornamentation could be bushes right bushes here and let's say you know there's a creature in the distance here now if what we're doing this is this is just a quick kind of explanation for what i was talking about there because i know we didn't really get to talk uh in person about it uh so you've got your person here you've got a person in the distance and then you have these different objects that are not focal points okay when we're talking about focal points you have to think about them in terms of focal depth as well so the z depth going into the image right the 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 uh the distance you can have cool, interesting things in the distance, but they cannot be as detailed as your foreground object, right? This is because you're using a, you're using a system of painting that's meant to mimic vi a relative visual reality. You need to also kind of follow the rules of how lenses work. So if you have a focal point up here, the things that are on that field of depth are going to have more uh focal commonality than the things in the distance now you can choose to play with things and soften things because this is what this is where narrative illustration comes from where you make the decisions you want to show something that's more important in the background than the trees on the side totally fine totally fine there's other ways to do this than to just make this in focus and this in focus and then everything immediately around it is blurry that is going to be visually confusing to your viewer because our eyes don't work like that. Think of it like like when you're looking at something, okay? So I'm looking at the camera, right? I see the camera and then the wall behind it becomes blurry. My focal depth is the field distance of the camera itself. If I change the focal di distance to here, for instance, I can see now the focal distance of the pen and also I'm probably a little cross-eyed for you guys. But now the everything else behind that is blurry as shit. So what what you had is a distant shot. So that that distant focal lens allows for a, a clearer um, it's it's clearer detail in a greater depth. But you still have to follow the rule that that layer of space. Think of it as almost like carving out a chunk of depth. That's the focal depth right there. That's where you're most focused, mo most in focus. If you have one section, right? Like this section here is our focal depth. And then you have a section in the distance that's also at focal depth. That's going to cause problems visually. So anyway, that I, I hope you're, you're understanding the, the, the problem that we're having. So here's some solutions because I understand what you're trying to do. You have a thing to show here, a figure here, and a figure in the distance, right? So here's some ways that you can handle that. You can have this as your focal depth. You can you can even do equal focus, which is an unlimited focus. What do they call that? An infinity focus, right? On your camera, where it's a little has a little infinity sign. That's when you have a, that's when you have a detail at every depth. So there's, you can change focal depth, you can change the focal uh, detail depth too, this way. So you can have everything in focus and then it's gonna be about color, it's going to be about how you use your values. In the case that you've done it, I would do an infinity style focal depth, which means there's e relative detail everywhere. Obviously you're still gonna put what you're gonna to wanna to do is treat it in a 2D fashion that this is, and everything around it has nice detail because this is the place we wanna look, right? 
But then you can do things like the field that's in between is nice and lit, right? And then whatever, maybe this figure is inside uh, like a little house or a little gazebo or something like that, and they're cast in shadow. So now you have darks against lights. You see, now you have a secondary focal point without over detailing that area. Uh, you could do this with color. Let's say you've got some flowers back there and those flowers could be pretty colorful, maybe, uh, and it would just be around that figure. And it's colorful relative to the area, not to the entire image. You have to remember that if you're treating any part of your image uh, with uh, visual interest, it has to be in the relationship of the greater whole. You're not doing just a mini or comp miniature composition right in that one spot. Does that make sense? So to recap, if we're going to have trees or bushes down here, right, they need to have the same level of detail as your guy that's standing there, right? Hanging out, you know, with a, with a bat for some reason. Okay. So that's going to be the focal depth detail. Okay. And then you're going to have difference. You're going to have, because this is an infinity focal depth, this will, this back here, all of this stuff will also be lovingly painted and carefully done with thoughtful brush strokes where you see clear light and dark on something. It can't just be brushy, especially in the foreground. And as you go back into the distance, you can become a little bit more brushy. But detail, a universal detail is going to be key because this is an, an infinity focus. And then you draw attention to your distant details in other ways. You can also do paths or things like that that kind of lead back to, right? That's an awful path. I, I should just slap myself in the face for that. Uh, so you have a little path that kind of winds towards us and shows us that we can walk through this space to these people in the distance, okay? So that's another way to have a secondary uh, uh, focal point without detail being the focal point uh, uh, system that you're using, all right? Um, and then this this is very important. So when you're doing the, the painting part, like let's say you've got the leaves on the trees in the foreground, okay? And it's very tempting because they're not important to just kind of do like little leafy whatevers. That's not necessarily what I mean when I say using br using brushwork to imply things and to make them not important. What you're going to do here is leave, you're going to want to do the same kind of detail that you would do. Like let's say this figure has like really intricate uh, clothing on with lots of really beautiful patterning and things like that. If this thing is in the same focal depth, focal depth, it needs to feel like it belongs in that in that chunk. So you would go out of your way to make sure that, okay, yes, I'm accounting for, for contours in particular, because this is meant to be a field of things. You're accounting for those little shapes, those little sub compositions, those little shapes within a shapes, the extrusions, things like that. You're gonna fill that up so it feels like it belongs in that space. And when it comes to lighting, you can do simpler lighting. You can do maybe two tones at most, but you want to make sure that those tones are thoughtful and careful. You need to treat everything that's within that, that focal depth with the same amount of care. Dan Rob, you took Anthony Jones' mentorship years ago and tried doing a stylized dwarf character, but he pointed out that it just looked like a badly drawn real character with stubby limbs. What was that in relationship to that I was just saying? That's rough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, AJ, what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> you flub this every time, Cypher. Welcome. Uh, which part do you flub? The, the focal thing? I mean, with your work, it's your work is hyper. What I would say is it tends to be in the vein of having a very macro, ex, macro um, focal depth. It's almost like uh, those images of like, you know, a bug on a flower and then everything in the distance just kind of becomes soft and fluffy. That's what yours feels like. And that's that's fine. That's that's a specific style of camera. So you have a focal depth. It's just like me, you know, when I was talking about. So I'm looking at my pen. My pen is very much in focus, but everything behind it is blown out. So what you should be doing is probably looking at uh, bokeh, bokeh blurs 
if you're interested in making some sharper shapes in the background. I think you've toyed with it at times, but you can do bokeh uh, blurs and they're, they're like little circles that represent this, these light sources. And they can be a very cool effect because it gives you sharp edges on something that's technically blurry. You get a nice visual range with that. A suggestion for a lesson, maybe believable stylization, separating bad anatomy from exaggerated anatomy. That's a good one. That's a good one. So that's one of the things I'm kind of thinking about with this class is, so we've been working on the logic of light and color for a long time. I feel like I've conveyed all of the important stuff. And at this stage, what I'm doing is just refining and explaining things more thoroughly. What do you guys think about actually changing it so where it's a new series, like maybe going into character design specifically, would that be of interest to you all? Like uh, how to how to develop, well, maybe not just character design, but concept art. Because I feel like the logic of light and color, I I really have kind of explained everything I can explain. It's just about detailed, detailed explanations in those different elements. I could go either way, really. I think if, if I'm going to make a big change, like uh, slowing down from a monthly release of episodes, that it might be wise to actually just change, just branch focus completely. Irina, you'd stick around for that? Okay, I'll, I'll sit, I'll ponder that this weekend. It's going to give me something to think about for sure. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of things need to be decided quickly. All right, so hopefully that explains the focal depth thing I was talking about. And if any of you have questions, lean in at any time. I mean, I'm happy to discuss this stuff. I'm just painting doodle, the doodle bug in the meantime while I wait for you to ask stuff. So, at your leisure. Excuse me, goddamn coffee. And talking just makes me so burpy. I do like some of these earlier shows because people tend to talk a little bit more. I get, I get lurkers a lot in the evening shows and they just kind of quietly watch me paint, which is fun. It's fine. That's, that's also, so I talk more during the, it's an interesting dichotomy. I talk more during the earlier shows, but at the same time I get less done. <laughs> So I don't know, what do you guys prefer? Do you prefer me blabbing or do you like to just watch me paint and shut my my camel mouth? <laughs> are, are you right to say that shapes will still remain fairly hard edged to find on unimportant areas within the focal area, but inside the shape that, yes. Demage, welcome. Uh, Irina, I think, I think I'm following you and I, I think yes, that is, that is a good goal to have. It's going to be about controlling where you put the interior detail. If you have something that's in that specific focal space, edges, especially contour edges of a shape, are going to be really, really important. And you can be a little bit softer with the, the fill details. When you create new edges within that fill detail, like it, let's say you have, let's say you have the, the bulb of a tree, right? So that, that all of the foliage, you're doing the outer contours of that thing. Cool. But then let's say you have another branch that's coming out. If this is an area in which you have a great amount of detail, then you're going to want to do the contours of that edge also, of that, of that ball that's sitting in front of the other ball. It's going to be about contours. And then the fill information, you have to be thoughtful about. You need to create you know, smooth, clean edges. You need to create nice gradations, but it's, you're not gonna wanna go super detailed in there. What I wanted you to avoid with the painting that you did was to do strokes like this. You cannot do this kind of thing. You can't do a stroke like this, or let's, let's say that's actually the shadow part, whoops. So a shadow, there's a shadow of a leaf. Here's the highlight of the leaf. You can't, you can't do that. They need to, the, the anatomy of whatever it is you're painting at that level of focal depth has to be clean. It can't be real scrubby and sketchy because that's at the same depth as your really detailed figure. Hey, Naomi, welcome. 
Glad you could join us. You neglected contours. 100%. That is what, what you missed was the contours and, and uh, carefully applying those strokes so that they, they feel mapped to each other. So if you're doing this same thing, what I think would be more effective would be to, let's uh, actually just do this, paint your shadow. That's not dark enough. Whoa, what the? Okay, so that's your shadows, right? And then you can come in and start figuring out where the lights are in this thing, but they need to they need to live within within each other. You can't be brushy and super loose unless what you're attempting to do is more uh, like Cypher style, where it's going to have uh, it's it's going to show a great amount of separation due to not being in focus. That kind of thing up here works great if your focal point, let's say, uh, let's say it's this character here, and you have in the distance. Behind them, they're, you know, they're standing in front of trees and bushes. This you can do. You can use that approach and be real scribbly. Be like, oh, okay, yeah, there's, there's just the idea of those shapes. That's fine because this is very detailed. We have, you know, the feather and and the helmet, and you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? That is a relationship that can work because the focal depth shows us that this is in macro and this back here is all blown out. You cannot have something that's on the same focal depth totally blown out like that unless you're doing this. So if you're doing this and your your character is here and this is at the same depth, you can fake it. Um, there's a lot. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, on your phone right now, probably you have a filter or not a filter, but a, a mode that's like macro mode or, or food shot, like food photography shot. And what that does is it fakes it. So it will give you focal depth dif differences and then it'll also just blur everything on the outside. So that's fake, it feels fake, it looks fake, but it's an effect. So it's being thoughtful when you do it. But even then, you, you can't do something that's on that depth of detail where you are painting so loose that the that there's not a relationship between the light side and the dark side of a lit object. Does that make sense? You can't just paint paint a stroke and a stroke. Totally separate. Portrait mode, is that what it's called? <laughs> okay. I didn't want to belabor, I just wanted to make sure that it, that I was being clear, because sometimes when I blab I like bah, 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 I'm not making a whole lot of sense. Oops. Just the noises come out of the big man's mouth. No worries. You're done with that. Uh, you're done with that commission, right? You already turned it in. Not yet? Oh. Oh, Irina, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's hard. Oh, man. I've definitely been there. I know how you feel. This is the job that never ends. SMRT. That's a good idea. Just move on and, and just make it go. Believe me, we all get one of those. It happens to all of us.
Definitely need to do something about this TV color. Uh-oh. I did a... What layer is that on? <gasps> oh no, did I... Nope, that's... Okay. Where is that damn green at? Oh, oh. Oh, okay, that one. Wasn't turning off. Yeah. I don't think that glow is going to work at all. So what we're going to have to do is really push the, the actual light and how it's affecting the doodle bug. But before we get to that, let's finish up this TV stand and stuff. You get tired of stuff so fast, you don't know how anyone ever finishes anything. It's, just like, it's true. I'm, I'm the same way. Uh, that's why I try so hard to finish it really quickly because I know that when I lose steam I don't have I don't have what it takes to finish it. I've lost steam on Doodlebug uh, and it happens I mean, I've actually abandoned a few paintings here on Twitch Thankfully nobody's brought them up, but uh, Yeah, it's a it's a, a hazard of the job Answer my question earlier, you personally love it most of all when I educate during the stream, narrating when I paint or answering questions. Okay. I well I will try to keep doing that. Yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. Like half of the game is to is to keep things as they are so that uh, people that are following are getting what they what they signed up for. And then, also, you got to find a way to get more people to watch to actually make it a viable, uh, viable job. So it's it's tough. One of those things. Got to find that happy medium, or find the thing that I do that is unique that will make people want to hang out. <laughs> the witticisms. There's no witticisms here. Ain't nobody but us chickens. What happened there? Didn't tell you to do that, you weird bastard. plan to do the critiques next Thursday or the week after I don't know just yet it will depend on uh, the lesson let's see when is the night let me look at him let me look at my schedule here okay so the ninth is Friday no it will be after the week after because uh, the videos will the video and all the rewards will go out on the ninth itself which is the day after Thursday so yeah, it's the it's the Thursday, the first Thursday usually following the release of the rewards. So you have until, but you have until the ninth to post anything if you want on Patreon in order to get the critique.
Hmm. What if I do it? What if I go the other way with this? Lazy, uh, what's the word? Extrusion. <laughs> That's good enough. Just gotta work out my edges here. These little fills I did are not, uh, they're not clean enough. I always like to have some like brush indications, some a little bit of like a little bit of the messiness of of the brushwork. But that anytime you're doing a solid flat object, the gradients need to be very smooth looking ultimately. And uh, you can you can have this you can have the texture in there, but it's going to be about value control, so that the values are very very tight and the gradations are very smooth. You can have a. a pretty massive amount of value movement in a gradation on a flat plane, like going from a light to a dark, uh, but that it ha the more extreme the value change is, the smoother it needs to be, the transition. And if you've done your job right with a really smooth transition, it will not be clear uh, visually immediately that you have actually painted a light side to your um, your plane now i as i said i like chunkiness i like brush strokes so a little bit in there doesn't bother me so much um i like to show a little bit how the sausage is made in that if, in that respect but take a look at this so we've created a, a slight gradation but a color pick from the light side and paint it to the dark side, you see the difference in value? It's massive. So that's a that's a simultaneous contrast thing. That's where you're actually doing the opposite of simultaneous contrast. You're you're using simultaneous contrast in order to make big value changes in a value key without making it clear that you've done that. We're very sneaky. We're very sneaky artists in this in this uh, Twitch channel. Okay, I think, let's see, for the TV, it might be worthwhile to do another layer. Let's see what... because the uh, the top edge of the TV was getting a little bit lost on the back side. I'm gonna go back to the previous layer and we can just do a quick uh, seam, panel seam.
I'm using very, very sharp straight lines. Uh, probably not a great idea because so much of this is curves, but um, again, I have fatigue with this painting already. I want to move on to something else, so I just want to get it done. Bug, some contact shadows real quick. Have I played with Magma Studio yet? No, uh, I saw a little bit of it working with the uh, with the Lightbox uh, crew, uh, but I have I myself have not done anything with it yet. Um, I got to get on. Like I said, I, I'm really bad about it. Once the stream is over, I, I get back to work on everything else, and I kind of forget. So I, everything reflects back like, oh yeah, I wanted to do that. Um, have you played with it anymore? Is it still remaining uh, a, a popular interest on Twitch in general? So guess that the animation is going to be out of the question. Oh, I must have missed something. Is there a Fresnel effect in a shadow area like under a tree from the sunny background without light hitting the object directly? Ooh, you might need to explain that one better, Irina. That's a very specific technical question. Um, I, I think I understand, but could you clarify for me, please? Uh, I guess animation. Oh, animation of this. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, right, right, right. The, the uh, animated GIF. Yeah. Mm. Could still make that work. The problem is just the painting itself is not. I don't think it's very tight. The values are kind of. It feels um, too squishy to me, but maybe the may, it could be that that's exactly the place where I can add some really nice sharp stuff is in how it's lit from the TV. I could stylize that anyway. When I say stylize, I mean stylize the lighting, not the figure. Everything in this is stylized, but the lighting is pretty realistic. Like in your recent painting, say if the background is bright and light is from the side, will the figure under the tree get the light on the edge from behind? I've got to say, I'm even more confused now. <laughs> Air Fresnel effect in a shadow area from the sunny background without light hitting the object directly. So the Fresnel effect is going to be, it will be most visible when you have a strong light source that's behind. So, so it's possible. Mm. I, I'm hesitant to give you a firm answer on that because it's definitely gonna be a situation by situation basis. I'd say the best case, that without looking at it again right now, uh, the best case scenario would probably be to go with what feels like it looks best to you and not worry about the accuracy of whether or not it can happen. Um, generally a Fresnel, when you're getting into Fresnel effect, you're going, we're talking like tertiary or cardinary light sources. So, I mean, for you to start digging into that, it's gonna have to be really, really rendered. Um, you're gonna have to definitely have a primary light and a fill light all sorted out at, at least so i would i would yeah i would avoid it um, especially so the fresnel is going to be something that you see on really shiny objects like really smooth uh, glossy things or you're going to see it on really fluffy things so true i'm thinking like i'm thinking combination of the lighting scenario but also the material you're talking about the tree bark itself the only way you're going to really see a Fresnel is with a really, really strong light source behind it uh, and that's causing any little kind of 
tidbits on the surface to pick up that li that r that light. I can speak English. It will pick up that light on that edge in a rim light. So yeah, I'm hesitant. I'm very hesitant to say that you would that it would work with a tree. Less people using it since the event ended, but it still pops up every now and then. Bobby has jumped on it with an open invite on YouTube. Nice. How was that? Sketching with uh, Bobby Chu. He's a cool guy. I like Bobby. Hopefully that answers your question, Irina. I'm sorry if it's a little spacey. I have been getting up at the ass crack of dawn. I'm very much more dependent on my coffee. <laughs> Nope, too much. Let's take it to here, and then I'm gonna color pick that, and they use that as the remaining shadow. Simultaneous contrast, yay! We'll do the opposite here. I wanna cool this way off from this side. Right. Not bright enough. Goldilocks. Avid, hi, welcome. How's it going? Thanks for joining us today. The table's probably good for this stylized chunkiness that we're after. Easy for the critique review. Can you do a portfolio review instead or only a single piece? It's meant to be just for a single piece. Um, it's to make sure that everybody gets a, a, a reasonable amount of time. A portfolio, a portfolio review is pretty intensive. That's not to say that I would never uh, consider a portfolio review. It'll probably be something that maybe we can, uh, I can set up maybe a portfolio review uh, tier or something like that. But it's, the problem is it's just, it takes a lot of time to, to do it, to do it right. Uh, I think it takes time because it's, it's almost like a mentorship session or something. I can make 50,000. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Maybe, maybe, yeah, so that it's a, uh, it's a reward for, for watching. Yeah, like I wanna make these things accessible. That's the thing. I definitely wanna like make sure that it's, uh, it's something that we can talk about and I'd love to be able to do it on Twitch, but it's, it's definitely, it's a time sink. So I would say if, if you're not getting at least an hour on a, on a good portfolio review, uh, you're probably not getting, enough uh, to really help you out. Most of the portfolios I've done, I'd say, well, you know, maybe not an hour, maybe half an hour. I've done a lot of half hour portfolio reviews at shows and things like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's tougher in this kind of situation because there's no pressure to move on to the next thing. That's, that's my concern. When you've got a, a line of people, uh, you know, everybody kind of understands that the time is limited. When it's unlimited, it can get it can get lengthy. Not too much. I mean, uh, yeah. If if you're okay with just like a quick overview, like you, you have just one question, then I, I guess uh, we can we can try it out. How about that? Let's try it out. You can post your portfolio. And uh, we'll look at it here on Twitch uh, real briefly. I'd say put a single question to it, something really focused that I can give you, actually give you viable information. My, my hope is just to help you. <laughs> I'm so sweet and handsome. Yes, I am. Now, I'm, I just want to be able to help you guys with the limited time that we have. 
as much as I can and give you valuable information. <laughs> just don't think five minute portfolio review is going to be much help, but we'll try it. We'll try it. Twist my arm, why don't you? somewhere on social media before I start streaming there doesn't seem to be an increase in your regular viewer numbers I do not uh, a lot of things that I read advised against it because the um, what happens is you you annoy the people that are that are following you on your social media and then they stop following you on social media rather than following you on the thing on, on twitch for instance so I don't know I'm awful at social media guys I'm really bad at it I'm bad at self-advertising I try um, I, I try to listen to the experts, but I'm, I'm just bad at it, frankly. I never know what to do. Maybe once a month do it. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I mean, how did you all find find the find my Twitch? Was it just from? Well, many of you that are on at this time are patrons, but uh, those of you that are not, did you find me through uh, social media or did uh, Twitch recommend you? How did that work? Curious. You always get email notifications. That's awesome. But did did you have to sign? Did you have to like? Uh, you had to click the little notification bell or something, right, Naomi? Twitch every now and then, and it's a pleasant surprise, nice. Well shit, uh, I definitely need to figure that out, because that's not working. Good approach to this is to make a print screen of the Twitch screen after you start streaming. Just tweet it with a message, join us live on Twitch. Print screen with the Twitch screen. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder if there's a way to... I know that they're, they're like, if this, then that um, little programs you can run that'll say, you know, I'm, I'm, twi I'm twitching. Wait, that's not that's not a verb, but yeah, <laughs> I'm on Twitch, and I'm just worried about annoying people. That's how I'm with all of my advertising. I just don't want to be annoying. <laughs> all right, so for Cipher, we are gonna try and do a quick lighting pass. I think. Let's do this under the TV. It's more personal, people see your face. Yeah, Izzy's currently twitching. Ah! <laughs> okay, all right, I'll, hmm. And it's gotta be, of course, it can't be a repeat. It 
can't be the same one, right? Because that's what people don't like. Hmm. <laughs> so for this light, everything else is super is very realistic and straightforward. This light, I'm going to totally stylize. I'm going to keep it on a separate layer. I mean, the other thing is, right, so in, in response to the uh, the question you asked, Amage, about the numbers, so I get a lot of, um, you know, lurkers, they'll come in, and uh, I think this is common for everyone, but I don't really have a, a basis for comparison, but they'll come in and uh, hang for a little bit and then pop out. So my actual numbers are higher than, you know, whatever it is now. Uh, pretty significantly in terms of new viewers, but they don't they don't uh, uh, followers and they don't follow and stuff like that. So that's the other thing. I was kind of risking it, risking it and thinking maybe I could just it'll just be about content. So if people dig what they're seeing, boom. That's if it's good enough, then that'll be what's nece will be what was necessary to get it done. But I also found that that didn't work on Patreon either. So I don't know, like I said, I'm just real bad at this shit. <laughs> it is not my forte. We just started using the lasso trick and it's all kinds of awesome. Oh yeah, it's awesome. I love it. I figure it's just gonna be a learning curve thing. I'll figure it out eventually. How to get this how to get this working. I'm patient. I just want to make cool stuff, hang out, talk about art. Oh, thanks man. I I'm really glad you think so. I hope I hope it's good. I try. Again, we're going for stylized, so I want real chunky. Thick, almost toothpastey light. And the reason for this is because it's not going to be solid. We're going to flicker it. Thanks, you guys. We'll get there, we'll get there. It's time, it just takes time. I mean, a lot of the folks that I know that have really like blown up over the years, it didn't happen right away. Um, they've all, like even Peter told me, it was just like consistency. I'm going to group values here. Again, it's meant to be overexposed and washed out. That's when I say toothpastey, that's what I mean. It's going to be really overexposed light.
you've checked out a few popular channels over the last few weeks, but you just really prefer the, this format. <laughs> Thanks, oh my god. <laughs> a blush. Yeah, yeah, that's the format I'm hoping. But like I said, it's it's just one of those things like I thought that would work with Patreon and it didn't. Um, maybe maybe this is the venue for it. We'll see, we'll see. I'm giving it a shot. I'm all in. I just don't want to be the guy that's like, boo, complain. I'm, uh. It's so tempting because a lot of this just isn't, it's just not fair. It's just how it is. You don't have control, it has nothing to do with you. And it's important sometimes to remind yourself of that, that shit when like you run into these pitfalls. And nothing to do with me. Just happen to be the algorithm or whatever. Yeah. My lack of, of pretty boobies. Notice I didn't say lack of boobies. <laughs> Too old school. Feels inauthentic. <laughs> yeah, no one said life would be fair. Yeah, I think cont the actual content that you're painting is huge too. Um, Ross also is just really high energy. He's, he's a really cool guy. And yeah, he's been, he's, he had production value before, you know, any other artists really did. And so he's, he has slayed in that respect. And I knew, I knew, I think I mentioned this last time, I knew I couldn't keep up when I started seeing his stuff on YouTube. And I was just then starting to go out to see. There was no way in shit I was going to be able to compete with that. So I didn't even try. <laughs> he's just too, he's too good. Is I'm getting farther from the light source uh, because this is a it's a, a blown out light source but I want to imply that the drop off is really fast like it's not a strong light source it's bright but not strong uh, I'm gonna let the let, the, let it kind of soften a little bit more as it gets further away and make it less toothpastey and, and really sharp The key will be to make this an animation is I'm going to have to do kind of two, maybe two at least different um, sort of lights like this. So this will be one and then I'll do another one that will maybe be slightly slanted so that the, we want to see the cast shadows kind of shift a little bit. And it, it doesn't need to be much at all to get the effect to work because when you have everything else still a little bit of motion moves a lot. with your temporary is Izzy vision. <laughs> Those are the painter's eyes. You follow John Silva since last year. He's grown from about 100 to almost 500. That's nice. What's he doing? When you say he's mostly having fun, what do you mean? Like he's just painting silly stuff or like there it's games. It's more about games and hanging out. Yeah, like I said, I know this is going to be a long haul thing. It's going to take it's going to take years. It's okay. But it's part of why I want to integrate the work with this is because then it's really easy because I, you know, I, when I when I get up and I punch in my my time card, I don't have a time card, but you get the idea. Then I'm already on Twitch and it's just we're good to go. I don't need to do it separately from the rest of my life. It'll just be integrated. It'll make it a lot easier.
<laughs> okay, I'm starting to like it again. Cypher, you were right. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> He's just being himself, not really art-related. Okay. Decodes was really helpful. Decoding other people's pro art techniques. Basically fan art versions of tutorials. Oh, interesting. The upside to something like that is it's just like, it's just tons of content. Every new person that's out that's good can do a decode. That's smart. Hmm. Flickering it to see where I'm missing. <laughs> you have fallen back in love with Doodlebug. That's good. I guess the quickest way to boost your ears is to paint some pretty ladies. Yeah, you're probably right. I just won't do it. I've never really done it. Um, or when I do, I always make it horrifying in some way. I always want to punish a person that's only coming to me for that. <laughs> so I will make them just creepy as hell. But it's fun. I mean, I, I love painting women. It's, it's true. <laughs> you didn't fall out of love, but you're loving hard now. Well, that's good. It's I think it's definitely helping. So, I'll I'll do this in another light source, like I said. The truth is, you stop following most people because you just don't have time to watch them, just to chat about random stuff. You're hoping to see something of value. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Ladies with boobies do sell art. I was hoping that maybe I could kind of. With the creepy cute idea, I was hoping I could kind of get something there, like get a more uh, more of a female demographic or something, but maybe it's too creepy. It's a problem I've got. <laughs> I'm just going to stick with the, if you build it, they will come field of dreams mentality for now. I mean, I'm not saying I won't ever just completely go crazy and start painting some cool fetish stuff or something. I don't know. The problem is, is I'm not really sure what you can get away with on Twitch. I think they're pretty tight about their content uh, limitations. walk away feeling a wee bit smarter. <laughs> that's a good way to walk away from anything. I suppose that's true. 
Well, thanks. That's, that's a hell of a compliment. Appreciate that. Yeah, I I still like to do the the fetish stuff. I've done some. Uh, I did I did some. Uh, I did a painting for the new hardcover, uh, hardcover two anyway, not new. He's already advertising for entries for the third one, but uh, the second one I did some art for. Cause I, I like painting erotica. It's fun. Yeah, old school Ariok. That was definitely a mood. <laughs> Okay, so because this section here is, is more perpendicular to the light source, we're brightening it back up again. And I'm going to accentuate that, actually. Um, ironically, not, not necessarily by making this brighter, which I think I'm, I'm actually going to dim down just a touch, but by making this down here darker. Before I go too far on that, uh, my goal was to finish up the TV so that I could finish up Doodlebug. And the fact is, I haven't finished rendering everywhere in Doodlebug, so we gotta go back. Take a step back to Doodlebug for a minute. <laughs> Doodlebug, getting naughty. <laughs> Doodlebug hides some things under those prosthetic legs. Things we don't talk about here on the channel. <laughs> Ow. Finishing stuff, yeah. Yeah, I have to do it. Boo. Well, you can see I still have, like, up here, there's still just straight up line art visible. <laughs> I think this is where I finished out last time. I, I was just starting to kind of get into doing, uh, finishing out his little collar, his little fur doodlebug collar. Let's see, what will it be? Am I gonna go lazy? I think we're going lazy, guys. It's time for lazy. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Feel bad for Doodlebug because he can't read the chinos. It's true. I kind of imagine he just kind of just throws it at his face, <laughs> and then he's got maybe you know what? Actually, Doodlebug has little cuddle, cuttlefish tentacles, so that means he's hiding two hunting tentacles, and those two hunting tentacles can shoot out, go, whoosh, and then they grab the Cheeto whoosh, right back into his little face. So he's fine. You don't got to worry about him. Doodlebug is fabulous. So fluffy. Ha <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Doodle bug grunting. <laughs> yeah, he definitely has to kind of like roll up like a... And then... And he hits it. Is he like a woodlouse mutant? I have no idea what Doodlebug is supposed to be. I did tell you, I think when he first started, maybe you didn't see it, Irina, because I think it was on a Sunday, uh, that he was, he's partially inspired by Star Wars. Uh, there was, I've told the story before about how I watched, or I listened to the Star Wars records when I was a kid. Well, there was one particular story, and all of those stories, they were little like storybooks read for you and performed with a little you know, the lightsaber noises and the blaster sounds added to it. And uh, there were these creatures in a one of those episodes called Hoojibs. And I didn't, I don't know exactly what they look like, but I remember they looked something like this. So if you were to look up the Hoojibs, I have a feeling the Hoojibs will look very similar to Doodlebug. Because I was thinking about the Hoojibs when I drew them. <laughs> well, I have, you know, special experience acting out fat little creatures, being one myself. <laughs> I'm sure some of them do it, especially, like, the hot lady ones. That's a whole fetish right there. <laughs> Your daughter has pet wood lice? That's awesome. Just to be clear, wood lice are what we call pill bugs, right? Or, or roly polies. Cypher, you raise caterpillars? That's awesome. Next time we'll be dressed up as a doodle bug. No, no, no costumes on Sketching with Izzy. I don't even have costumes from a dog. We will have to continue to exist in a world without those things. Isopods, yeah. I can definitely see why you would why one would wonder. He's got isopod qualities. Like a fat. Actually, I think I think it's kind of more of a mix of a tick and a manatee <laughs> in a fur coat. Because there is absolutely something wrong with me. I'll be the first to admit it. I know. I'm adding sort of the base state lighting from the TV that we have without, if we turn off our, oh, it's already off, yeah. Without the, um, the, the flash, the first flash, flash one. shadow of his head onto the fur and I also need to apply the cat shadow of his doodle it's good enough Saturnids, specifically since they're regionally endemic, and they're so dark, cute, and cool. Are the Saturnids the ones that are like uh, orange and black, the little fluffy ones? 
tick and a fur coat. <laughs> yeah, a tick and a fur coat with a little doodle coming out of his head. I love it. <laughs> That's so cool. Caterpillars are pretty fun. We used to get uh, silkworms. I remember doing that when I was in school, like elementary school back in the day. I remember the smell. It was such a distinct smell. That's a fun, interesting fact about me. I, I can, I have a weirdly good sense of smell. <laughs> and I can pick up, uh, with animals in particular, I can smell animals when they're around. And one of the ones that I smell that shocks people the most is, I can smell snakes. <laughs> <laughs> Snakes and uh, and I know the smell of uh, black widows. <laughs> I used to find them when I was a kid. Because people didn't believe me. They're like, what? You can't smell a spider. They're like, follow me. There's a spider. Surprise. <laughs> it's a useless superpower, I tell you that. Just doing little kind of implied cast shadows from the fur. I want them to stretch. I'm gonna do some big ones here. Again, all leaning towards that kind of sort of a, a weird hyper realism on the creature, which doesn't match anything else in the shot. So it's kind of a make it make it feel a little sillier. Your daughter's got a snake? It did this, d does she make the snake and, and the wood lice fight? <laughs> a ball python, pretty. I don't think constrictors have the same kind of smell when I'm thinking of the little, like I can smell like garden snakes, um, rattlesnakes, things like that, like vipers. But it's usually when they're, I mean, it's not like I can track them from far away, it's just when they're right next to me. I know that there's a snake nearby, that's all. So, like I said, it's a useless, it's a useless ability. All right, so let's real quick do a lighting pass. Yeah. Too much talky, not enough painty. If I'm gonna bother with this fur brush, which is such a cheaty brush, but man, does it work great. Uh, I usually try to go in and do like a final carve in with real proper brushes, real, <laughs> with other texture brushes that don't feel quite so um, digitally. I think this is what I was using earlier, yeah. Um, the only reason I do this is just so that it, it doesn't, it, things don't feel too soft everywhere. I think that kind of variety helps kind of. Maybe that's not the brush. I thought you were the brush, but you're not the brush. You need the fluffy brush. Uh, you have it, I think. Uh, it's the first download that I give to 
new patrons is all of my brushes. You just have to look for it. It's in there. See, the effect that I get by throwing in this, this different kind of texture brush is it, it just stiffens up some of the bristles so they don't feel so, um, I don't know, inor inorganic and kind of, I don't know, just like fake, really fakey looking to me. That was too much, I don't like that stroke at all. Cash shadows real quick. Okay, so we've finished that. Was there anything else on Doodlebug that needed doing? I think, well, we can work out this light side just a touch more. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's just commit. <laughs> Welcome, Vatra. <laughs> He's enjoying a coffee. It's some. It's a bright coffee. Sack there. His little McConnell. Although his is young and nubile. <laughs> You've arrived and you are hypnotized. <laughs> he has that effect. He's done it to us all. You are captured. You are hypnotized by the doodle bug. You can never look away again. <laughs> Stay. Enjoy Cheetos. Can I explain why I place the TV's reflection in the specific position in the eyes? Yes. Uh, this is covered much deeper in my... Uh, materials lessons, but the essential concept of placement for uh, speculars is understanding first that a specular is a reflection of the light source directly, and, and like all reflections, it is going to, um, it's going to be mirrored on the spot. And the mirroring is a result of not just the position of the light source, but the position of the eye of the viewer, or in this case, the camera. So when you have an object that is lit with a specular, like this, okay, let's say it's a sphere here, and we have a light source that's coming down like this, right? I mean, from this direction. So the normal, these are the first three rules of light. You can find this on YouTube for free. The normal of the light source is the most perpendicular space or the most perpendicular spot on an object that's facing the light source. So if it's hitting here, like right here, this is the normal where it is, if it's, if you were to 
be an eyeball on the surface of whatever that object is, and you want it to look directly where your light source is, that's where the normal is. So for example, this light source, the normal of it would be here. That's the most perpendicular point on my face, right? So logically you would say, well, that's where the brightest spot is. Ah, no, that's where the brightest spot is on, an, on a matte object, but on a, on a glossy object or a slightly greasy one like myself, you're gonna get a specular. So the specular being the reflection means that your eye is involved. You can test this with any shiny object that you have. If you have, if there's specular on it, when you move, the reflection moves because the reflection counts on your eye's involvement. So how do we account for that? You figure out whatever the normal is of the light source itself. Thank you for the follow, Gezo. Welcome. You, you figure out what the normal is on your object that goes to the light source, and then you figure out the normal on the object that goes to your eye. So in this case, we have the normal coming from the object here, and we have the normal coming from the object, the light source here, and then from my eye, which would be straight on in this case, let's say right here. So the mirror is the in-between of those two points. So structurally, your focal point is in between the normal of the light source and the normal of your eye. Do you see it? So on a shiny surface like this, it's the normal of the light source and the normal of your eye. You see? Right in between those two points is where your shiny is. Same thing. Let's see if you can see it here. You see? And if we move it, and if we move it in relation to, if we were to move your eye rather, then that would change. So that's the essential basics. That's the most basic information I can give you on how your uh, specular reflections will work. It, there is more to it that's, it that's more involved, but it requires understanding materials. So you gotta check out the material lessons, but the basics of the rules are that. So when we look at our, when we look at the doodle bug, we have our light source here. And I just do this all automatically in my head now. The light source is coming at him and it would hit. So each eye, I, this, is, this is a narrative thing. So versus reality versus narrative. Okay, so reality is what I just gave you. Those are the hard, those, that's the facts. Those are the rules of how light behaves. When we're talking about narrative, sometimes it's important to fuck with the light a little bit. And so, with this, I did do a nor I did follow the normal rules here, and then from our view here, that's the in between. But with this one, I moved it just a little bit out of the way so that we could see his pupil, and that was a that's an artistic decision. But but it's close enough that the law still kind of feels right. Can you see it? Let's turn on. So we got, we got the lighting there. I think I'm gonna do his little mouth just a touch more. I told you I could, I could be filthy in here. Come on guys, come on now. Let's go, as they say. Kind of want to get a little bit of modeling up here. M O T T L I N G, modeling, I think. This is just to give him kind of a little bit of visual variety. I'm cleaning up some of my line work, which you can still see quite a bit of. You know the lesson, but you were thinking the reflection should be on the other side of his left pupil. 
this one here? Or were you saying that when it was this way? You started using Photoshop a few days ago and you're a bit lost? Well, I'm, I'm happy to explain anything if you have any specific questions. <laughs> the one above the cup. Oh, okay. All right. Well, also, it's remembering that the, the light source is close to him. It's very... It's... The distance of the light source changes where the normal is on something. So that's the other thing you got to remember. The distance of the light source is not infinite. Not always. It's only infinite when we're talking about the sun. When we're talking about light sources this close, so here we go. This is this is an extension of that same bit of knowledge. So if you have two objects, actually let's just grab a color here, one of these. Okay. So if you have, let's say, two objects, like a pair of eyes, right? And if we're following the logic, right, of light source, okay, so our light source is now closer, let's say uh, it's Turn off our TV for a second. Let's say the light source is here, okay? Does that mean that the normals are here? No. The normals to the light source are actually gonna be both pointing towards the light source. They're gonna be at an angle. So in this case, because the TV is closer, the light source, nor the light source normal is in different spots on each eye. Even though our norm, the normal to our eye is roughly in the same area, for those, for his eyes and his position, it's gonna to be totally different. So then we have the normal from the light source going to the eye here and going to the eye here, right? And then we have our camera. This is kind of a top-down view. Our camera is hitting here and maybe here. So then the in-between for those two things is actually gonna be in a different spot even though it seems like it should be in the same spot, it's not. Does that make sense? I'll leave that light source there as a little special secret just between us. This is my focal point, Irina, if you're still with us. Um, so in this case, I am I'm punching my values even further in this area. I'm not breaking the value key totally. It's kind of like what we were doing over here where you're able to punch your value key so long as you can push your value key very far, just so long as it feels like it's in the same key. You can take your values outside just a touch. So I'm pushing them here because I want this to be a point of interest. This, what this does by extending by extending the gradation and, and pumping the, the value key just a little bit in these areas it means that we have more subtlety to work with when you have a grander scale of in between values between point a and point b of your light key for instance in this case not always the light key but in this one case it is that means that i have more values to play with in order to detail more detail means more focal point right Then I can start throwing in these 
tertiary, quaternary details, really dig in there, really give payoff. You're wanting to give payoff to your viewer. This is a point of interest. You can hang out here for a minute, have a cup of coffee, relax, check out these cool details I gave you. That's the whole purpose of it. <laughs> these eyes, yeah. Well, I also need to add in, so since we were just talking speculars, I need to add in the speculars from the, the window light source. So we're gonna have to figure that out. Another way to punch your focal point is to introduce your richest, most saturated colors. So it just happens to coincide that this is a place where I might be able to, to hint at some subsurface scattering. So we're going to go ahead and introduce some just right here. Not really, I mean, there's subsurface scattering all throughout, but this is going to be the richest subsurface scattering so that this is a point where you're really like, your eye is drawn because of the color. This little doodle tip. Gotta pay, you gotta pay extra attention to the doodle tip. That's a rule. How well do my prints sell? They're pretty great. They don't really sell at all, bud. <laughs> um, the only things that really sell tend to be the magic card stuff that people uh, have some association with. It's just, it is what it is. I, again, I think it, it just ties back to my inability to advertise for myself. And I've never really been able to capture uh, the things that are really widely uh, popular. It's just, I don't know if it's a on purpose or or what, but that's just been the case for me. They do all right uh, for a passive income type type thing. I would certainly say if if you guys are ever thinking about doing prints and you find a site like Inprint, like I did, just just do it. I mean, it can't hurt to have them up there. Um, a little bit of extra scratch on the side for a coffee now and then doesn't hurt. I don't like the color I just chose for that. It needs to be much more saturated. You ever think of hiring someone to do that for you? Someone that, uh, someone ambitious yet okay making intern monies? You know, I hadn't really thought about it. There's like, I, I read, you know, like the four hour work week and all that stuff and saw how um, some people manage that. But it's such a, for an artist, it's such a job where they would need to, who, whoever was doing that for me, they would need to know my style. They would need to know how to, um, I don't know how to have my specific sense of humor with things and I feel like that's that would be a lot more expensive than just getting you know an intern to do it I 
I won't create the same subtle detailing in the furniture, no. So this is what I was talking about. Um, you, you, can, you can have areas that are in the same focal depth that are not equally detailed, but they need to be, they need to have uh, uh, the same care put into the edges. So the contours are refined for that area, but I don't want the interior details to, um, to conflict with the details of the face of the doodle bug in this case, or the fur, right? Um, you can absolutely, we can do that right now. I can show you, we can detail and we can go in here and carve up more details into this object and create, you know, greater, let's say, we wanna have the seams be a little bit more squidgy, but the colors need to be much more dull. They cannot conflict with the focal point that I've established. You can add, you can add as much detail as you want just keep it within the that value key that you've established already. Okay, okay, I got you, yeah. Oops, that's underneath something. Is it? Why can't I see you? So selection. Huh. Oh, oh, that's why. Okay. I'm a doom doom. Let's, uh, let's grab all of this and put it back in here. Okay. There we go. So we can add in seams. We can do all sorts of things detail wise. It's, it's totally fine. It's just you have to pay attention to your outer contours, the edges. This is the question. So it you can you can detail external focal points ad nauseum. Honestly, you can do it forever and never finish a single painting because you can just detail and detail and detail and detail. So the question is. I think what the, the more important question is, is what can you get away with not showing? And that's really where I think, I, I think I'd like you to start thinking about it is, is this an okay thing to not show? And that's going to be the challenge, right? So like with the leaves and with things in, in an exterior that are within that value or not value, but that focal depth, if you're able to decide, okay, this is something that's going to need a little extra time or this is something that I can ignore and just kind of only worry about the contours and save myself some time in the long run. That's what it's going to come down to. You're right there. You're right at that cusp where it's going to, where making those kinds of decisions are going to be really important for your, for your client work. So you, there's a, there's a, always a point where you're, you're basically, you are strong arming everything. Everything is being done. Everything is like you're putting in the time and you're, and you're getting, you're, you're doing it and you're getting mileage, which is great. But there will be a point where you're like, okay, I don't need to show this. So I'm going to completely omit it or I'll find a way around it or I'll figure out a shortcut. That's the next phase. Yeah. I think I think you know it too. I th I, th I think you with that last piece you you were that was the struggle right there was what can what can you ignore? I could tell. And that's good. Uh, you definitely want to be in that position. Thank you. 
Good, good. I'm, I'm really glad that helps. <laughs> Why won't anybody pay me to paint this stuff? I don't get it. <laughs> is this thing? This shit's so silly. Okay. You love his little calf muscles? Alright. Let us do one last doodlebug specific element. You might be right. <laughs> He's just watching The Wire. Over and over. <laughs> oh no, Doodlebug. Okay, now let's get back to what we were doing. Close up Doodlebug. Okay, so we want this light source to feel pretty chalky big. It's a screen layer, let's set it back to normal so I can color pick it. Come on now. What the fuck?
I'm just trying to do this part a little bit quicker. Sad day. Okay. I can just listen to the whir of my super loud fans. Okay. I think that's pretty good. Right, okay, so let's do another one real quick. Pick a slightly different color. See how it looks. Nope. <laughs> Love <do> Doodlebug. <laughs> He's very squidgy. It's his little belly, isn't it? You love his little doodle belly. Doodlebug. It is fun. This one's much weaker, so I'm not trying to push it all the way up. I'm, I don't think it'll even reach the pillow.
Okay, now we gotta decide which direction is gonna be. Is he facing this way? Or this way? I think this way is probably better. Um, okay, let's try and make an animation real quick. Let's do window. There should be timeline. Okay, so timeline's down here. <clears throat> For those of you that are curious, this is how you make your your animated GIF or GIF. Set it to forever. The controls are pretty similar. Um, to layers. So down here at the bottom, I hope you guys can see these. Oh shit, no, my camera's in the way. All right, there you go. We'll put it up here actually. Damn it, <laughs> everywhere I go, there's stuff over it that you can't see. Uh, all right, so down here, that's our frame. The way this works is each time you add a new frame, which is this little page icon here, just like for a new layer, what it's gonna do is it's gonna make a new frame. And so anything that's showing in the new frame, you can, will be the new frame. And then you turn on another frame and you change the visibility of layers and then you get a new new frame. There's perf. What? <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's go ahead and see how that looks. So first, what you have uh, down at the bottom, you can see there's a little timer there we can set this to delays of seconds and that's how long the frame holds on. Um, a second is a really long time. So let's do, uh, let's do half to start and then we'll do a new layer. And in the new layer, we will turn on our minimal light and then set that to a flicker, which is no delay, a new layer. And then we'll turn off that minimal light Right? And then what we can do is select these two. We can copy, I think. Let's see. Let's see if it works. Control C and then select this one, Control P. Nope, that did not work. So I'm undoing that. The important thing is, is that you can't, um, <clears throat> if you change something from layer to layer, you can't, uh, um, you can't change if you make a decision on a layer, if you change anything up here, it's going to affect that layer. And then when you make a new layer, everything's gonna be how the previous layer was. So you have to turn everything back on. All right, so that's the short of it. Let's do a new layer. Let's turn it back on, same. How do you make up your mind on what you flip you're gonna use for the final image? It's arbitrary. It's usually whatever feels good. Um, I try to remember narrative, so narrative Traditionally for, you know, Western style art reads left to right. So depending on what it is you're trying to say narrative wise, you can flip it. So for example, I have lots of illustrations where let's say uh, I want things to read smooth and clean. Okay, like in this case, we are him and we are watching the screen. Like we're going in this direction. It all has to do with that directionality. So we're with him, we're watching the screen, the screen is flashing back. That's where the animation is coming from, so I chose this side. But that's arbitrary, I mean, this is basically bullshit. And then there's other ones where maybe you have creatures that are charging and you want them to look really fast. You might have them facing in this direction also, the same direction I have him facing. Or maybe you have a character that's meant to look like they're halting something. So if they're halting something, maybe they're in the opposite direction, they're facing from right to left so that the camera is stopped on them. Your, your eye movement is stopped and held there. So it's, there is an aspect of narrative design to how you lay out and which side you choose to put your focus. And you need to think, I mean, it's a good idea to think about that from the beginning, but the fact is, is that that can change at any time. And it depends. I always make that decision, that hard decision at the very end. And I mean, literally, sometimes it'll be the last thing I do before I hit save as TIFF and send out to a client. It'll be flip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until I settle on the one that feels right. Um, 
this has some caveats and I have actually broken these a couple of times. So uh, let's settle in for a story. Um, I have on a few occasions, particularly with uh, Magic the Gathering, sent in finals where I flipped according to whatever it was that I felt told the story the best and to just to discover that I accidentally flipped a character that is off, is off model as a result of the flip. So let's say they have a scar on their right cheek and I flip them because the narrative is better. Well, now the scar is on their left cheek and they don't actually fit the, the model. They're off model. So I've had times where I had to make the decision, okay, uh, the, the composition is more important than the, the model. So I need to actually go in and repaint everything so that it's on the other side so that it's on model because the composition was better that way. And then I, on rare occasion, what will, have, what will happen is I'll just flip it back and it's not a big deal. Like it wasn't that much of a conflict over which one is better. But for me, usually one is always better, one direction out of the two possible directions, almost always. Yeah, suddenly someone becomes left-handed, precisely. Or if, you know, they didn't have a hand on the left side. I mean, it can be, I have done that with really extreme differences in what the model was intended to be. I'm super guilty of that. All right, so let's play it real quick. All right, real quick little flash stutter. Let's actually switch this one. It might be too fast. We might need to do, uh, let's try 1.1. Let's see how that looks. Mm. I mean, it certainly feels a little bit more like a, an animated GIF. So let's do a couple more with everything off. Actually, instead of making multiples, we can just set it to longer. So we can do 0.5, we'll make a new one, set that back to one. And now we'll turn on our big guy. Make a new one, turn it off. Let's set that to two. Make a new one, turn on our little guy. Make a new one, turn it off. Make a new one, turn it on. Make a new one, big guy. I have left, see what I did here? I made all these copies and they're all at two seconds. So I need to make, take them back down to one second delay or 0.1 second rather. All right, now let's see how it looks. <laughs> That's pretty fun. Let's mess with the timing just a little. I think one second might be too slow for some of these, so some I'm gonna turn to no delay. We're gonna make this one second. No, leave that too. So where's our bright boy? This is bright boy. Down to that, that. I want this to be bright boy instead. And off, bright boy. And one, let's do flicker on and off. All right, let's see how it looks now. important to not look at the timeline because that can be real distracting watching that animation try and just focus on what you're seeing with the uh, with the JPEG or the GIF yeah that looks up there I might need a third one now that I'm looking at it You can also adjust the opacity. Yes, you can, that's true. We can try that. You are very right. Let's do that one double. For this one, we are going to lower the opacity on this one. Dead right, I actually forgot about that. When you're doing this kind of animation, also it's a really good idea to make sure that you are done with all of the layers. You don't want to add new layers because when you add in a new layer, it's going to mess with the, uh, let's say we added a new layer and we added another light. 
if I added that new layer, that is going to be applied to all of them. So you have to go in and manually turn every single one off. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Let's make this a little bit longer. Well, no. What we can do is add one behind it and we'll make it a little bit shorter. So it's not a full second. But I forget, there is a way to copy, there is a way to copy frames, right? I feel like that, that's something that used to be the case. This is onion skinning, I think. Oh no, that's in betweening. Whoops. Thanks for hanging out, Arena. You, you stuck around for a long time. We appreciate it. Drag the frame onto the new frame button. Gotcha. Okay. You are right. This is the low opacity one, so we'll do... Oop. Drag him back here. It's all about... When you're doing this, it's just then about patterning so that it feels like it's a little less um, repetitive. So that first one, two, three, I don't like that much. So we're gonna change one of those. Off, on, off, on. Let's do this one, change the opacity. I select the layer. All right, let's see how that looks now. <laughs> what do you think? A good one? We're done? <laughs> I kind of like it as it is. It's My problem always with these kinds of gifts are that they are really, really repetitive. So maybe we could add like one, you know what, let's do top, do one new one, turn off everything, set that to one second. Add a new one. Oops. We can do, since this is a bright, a bright one. Make this one bright again. We can also do a fade. So we'll do, we'll start this one low. And we'll set it to zero. We'll make a new one. Set it about 10%, 20% higher. Make a new one. Do it again. And a new one. Do it up. Let's do a new one. We'll have a quick flicker where it goes down. A new one. And we'll go all the way back up to full blast before we make a new one and do the next, the, the light version. And I think that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good variation. It's what, 15, 20, 25 frames, 24 frames. So about a second of animation. Let's take a look. Action. Yeah, see, that feels a lot less patterny to me by changing that, doing that little kind of. Yeah, yeah, that works for me. Cool, huh? 
All right, so I will save this as a, as a GIF and I will uh, post that for you all to see. Pretty fun. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. <laughs> this is pretty fun stuff. You feel like it needs some kind of heavier floodlight than smaller moving lights? Could be. It's just that uh, I'm, I'm pretty much done with it now. <laughs> now I gotta add sound. <laughs> Maybe he's hypnotized also. Yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun little run. I like it. I wish that you could edit one, like let's say I wanted to paint this, like I wanted to add a reflected light from the, the bounce from the couch onto the, the roly-poly back. You can't do that where it would just edit to everything. It just fucks everything up. I remember I had all kinds of issues when I was first experimenting with the uh, timeline. It's also why I don't really mess with it that much anymore is it's very temperamental. So have fun with it, play around, enjoy. It's some good stuff. You have to do it on a layer you already have. Yeah, I believe so. Thanks, Dan Rob. Awesome. Well, I think that should wrap it up for us, gang. Hopefully you all enjoyed yourselves, had a good time. Uh, as always, paint smart, paint sexy. I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because, like they did, you want to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not. You're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair. But what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Like grammar is for language, light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using this simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper 
and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode 2, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode 3, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes 5 through 8 are all about rendering materials. Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap valuable and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration just like I do for Magic the Gathering. From assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end, each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy.